going on besties in this video we're going to be talking about reading specifically craft and structure let's get started so we're going to start with author's point of view so when we read we're not just looking at words on a page right we're stepping into the author's world seeing it through their eyes but guess what their viewpoint can dramatically shape the story but how does that happen? That's what we're gonna talk about in this particular section. So imagine that we have two people looking at the exact same house. One coming from a middle-class background might see their dream home, right? And the other who's accustomed to luxury might dismiss this as a mere shack. Fascinating, right? It's the same house, but their perspectives paint totally different pictures. This is exactly what happens in writing. An author's background, experiences, and beliefs color their narrative. It's not just about what they say, but it's how they say it. And that can really reveal a lot about what the author's stances are on various topics. Let's take a look at a practice question of what we're talking about. So the question states, what point of view does the author express in this passage? So the passage states, growing up in a small coastal town has always influenced my view of the ocean. To me, it represents freedom and a connection to nature that city life simply cannot offer. The sea is not just a body of water. It's a vital part of our community's identity and tradition, something that urban environments often lack. So our options are A, an objective analysis of the differences between coastal and urban environments. Maybe. B, a preference for coastal life over city life based on personal and cultural experiences. Yeah, absolutely. They do talk about that. C, a factual comparison of the environmental impact of coastal and urban areas. Or D, an unbiased report on living conditions in different geographical locations. So based on all the options that we have available to us, the most correct answer is going to be B. It Preference for coastal life over city life based on personal and cultural experiences. So as we stated before, the author's point of view is influenced by their personal experiences of growing up in a coastal town. This passage that we just read reflects that bias towards being part of that coastal lifestyle, emphasizing that deep connection to the ocean and viewing that as a symbol of freedom as well as community identity. Having been raised in a multicultural city, I've experienced the richness of diverse cultures firsthand. This has led me to believe that cultural diversity is essential for a vibrant and dynamic society. Cities that lack this diversity tend to be monotonous and less innovative in comparison. So let's take a look at our options. A neutral observation on the effects of cultural diversity in cities. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I don't think that's what they're talking about here. An analytical study of urban development in relation to cultural diversity. We don't really talk about that at all, so we can automatically eliminate that. An impartial overview of different societal structures in urban areas. While they do talk about diversity, they don't talk about the specific structures, so we can automatically eliminate C. And then lastly, we have D, a belief in the superiority of multicultural environments based on personal upbringing. To me, that one makes the most sense, so the correct answer is going to be D, a belief in the superiority priority of multicultural environments based on personal upbringings. So again, this is based on someone's personal point of view. That is what is influencing that writing. So this author reflects that bias towards those multicultural environments shaped by their personal experience of being raised in a diverse city. Next, let's talk about first, second, and third person point of view. So when we're talking about this, we're really trying to figure out who is telling the story and from what perspective are some of the most important choices that the author is making. So for example, if a story is told in a different point of view, it can entirely change the story altogether. So let's imagine the classic Rapunzel. We all know this story, right? So depending on who is narrating it, the prince, Rapunzel, or an outsider, the tale is going to look entirely different. First, let's start with the first person point of view where Rapunzel herself is telling the story. She could say something like, ouch, climb faster, will you? You're hurting me. Imagine Rapunzel's pain and impatience in the first person as the prince is struggling to climb up her hair. It's a completely different story, right? Now we have second person. So imagine that you are telling the story about Rapunzel. You are Rapunzel. So in this instance, you can say, you hear a voice below. Your heart races as you approach the window. Let down your hair, he calls. You hesitate. 
Then release your braided locks, feeling a tangle of excitement and fear. Finally, let's look at it from third person point of view. And this is usually how we're accustomed to hearing fairy tales, as they're usually told by narrators. So in this example, let's say the narrator states, Rapunzel, locked away in her tower, watched the world from above. Each day was the same until a prince, enchanted by her voice, discovered her. He called to her, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. And she cautiously, curiously, complied. You see how this, all three of these completely changed the story? That's what we're talking about when we're trying to figure out first, second, and third person point of views. Let's take a look at our first examples. So the question states, which point of view is used in this passage? So the passage states, in my years as a teacher, I've seen the impact of individualized attention on students' success. I believe that when educators tailor, tailor their approach to each student's needs, the results are significantly more positive. So looking at our keywords, we're seeing a lot of I, right? It's being told by that person. It's that first person point of view. So out of all of our answers that we have here, the best one is going to be first person A. Let's take a look at another example. Which point of view is used in this passage? So again, we're looking for those keywords. So Dr. Ellis holds the view that early intervention is crucial for the treatment of chronic diseases. She advocates for her proactive health screenings, arguing that this approach can lead to better health outcomes. So looking here, looking at those keywords, we're seeing words like she, right? So we know that it's not being told from the first person. We can automatically eliminate that. There is no you, yours, any of those words. So we can automatically eliminate the second person, but we are seeing keywords like she, her, things like that. So we can deduce that based on this particular passage, it is being told from the point of view of third person. The answer, correct answer is C. Next, we're going to move on to author's tone. So the tone is basically the author's attitude towards the subject, and the author expresses this tone through the use of different adjectives. So the tone can be judgmental, bias, it can even be emotional. It can also be positive, negative, and neutral. So these are some of the words that you're going to see used on your T's exam. So when we're looking at positive words, you're going to see things like optimistic, cheerful, enthusiastic, encouraging, very positive, bright words when it comes to that type of author's tone. For the negative words, you're going to see things like critical, pessimistic, disdain, bitter, angry, those really negative words. And then lastly, for neutral words, you're going to see words like objective, informative, detached, unbiased, really just a very neutral playing ground when it comes to the author's tone. So let's take a look at some examples of what that might look like in practice. So starting with positive, we have an example of, as I walk through the revitalized downtown area, the vibrant colors of the newly painted murals filled me with joy. The laughter of children playing in the fountain added to the lively atmosphere reminding me of the power of community spirit. So when we're looking at this positive tone, it's evident by the choice of words, right? So we have vibrant, joy, lively. It's the language that the author is using to create this uplifting, cheerful mood, focusing on the positive aspects of the scene. In contrast, when we're looking at negative tone, this example states, the once beautiful park lay in neglect, its paths overgrown, littered with debris. A sense of sadness washed over me as I observed the decay, a stark testament to years of disregard and forgotten promises. You see how the tone is completely changed here? We're looking at words like neglect, overgrown, litter, and sadness. The author is really trying to convey this sense of despair and neglect painted as a bleak and disheartening picture. And then lastly, when it comes to neutral tone, our example is, the report details the recent statistics on employment trends. In the last quarter, there was a 2% increase in job creation, primarily in the technology sector, while the manufacturing sector saw a slight decline. So this passage really just has kind of a neutral tone. It's really giving more of an informative stance on what is being conveyed, right? So they use words like objective, numbers, statistics. They're really clearly focused on providing objective data, objective information very clearly in regards to the use of this kind of passage. So let's do some practice questions. The question states, what tone does the author use in this passage? So the passage states, 
As the sun dipped below the horizon, it cast a golden glow over the meadow, transforming the scene into a blue of tranquility. The landscape, bathed in the soft light of dust, became a serene haven where every blade of grass seemed to stand still, as if in reverence of the day's end. It was as if the meadow itself, with its undulting hills and whispering breezes, was inviting onlookers into a realm of splendor, offering a momentary escape into its embrace. Let's see what we have as options. We have A, pessimistic and gloomy. Based on the keywords that we had, I don't believe that pessimistic and gloomy is going to be the correct answer. Detached and factual. Again, there's not a whole lot of facts. There's not a whole lot of statistics, objective data. So I would go ahead and say that that's probably also not going to be the correct answer. We have C, warm and appreciative. I do feel very warm when it comes to reading this kind of passage, right? They use words like soft dusk and tranquility and reverence. It does make you feel kind of warm and very appreciative of the environment. But let's look, take a look at our last example. Ironic and skeptical. Well, I wouldn't say that any of this is ironic or skeptical based on what we read. So based on all of our answers that we have, the correct answer is going to be C, warm and appreciative. In addition to positive, negative, and neutral tones, we can also have formal, nostalgic, tragic, and reflective tones. So when we're looking at formal tones, we're looking at factual, professional, and a structured tone. You're going to commonly see these kind of tones in like textbooks, encyclopedias, as well as biographies. When it comes to nostalgic type of tones, you're looking for those more sentimental, longing for their past, romanticizing memories, those kind of tones. So you're going to see a lot of like reminiscing about the good old days kind of narratives when it comes to your passages. Next, we have tragic tones. So tragic tones are more about like sorrow, devastation, despair, fatal loss. And you're going to commonly see these in reports such as like newspapers, maybe even see it on the news, especially. And then lastly, we have reflective kind of tones. So that's kind of like introspective, thoughtful, self-examination, as well as contemplation. You're going to see a lot of personal pronouns, right? I, me, those type of things, those first persons. You're going to see a lot of discussions regarding past experiences and personal feelings being used. So let's take a look at an example or a practice question of what that's going to look like. So for this practice question, the question states, what is the tone of the passage? So the passage states, the latest medical study conducted over a span of 10 years presents a comprehensive analysis of the effects of diet on heart health. Utilizing a large sample size and controlled variables, the researchers systematically gathered and interpreted data, ensuring scientific rigor in their findings. So here are our options. We have informal and conversational. Well, based on a lot of the words like statistics and comprehensive analysis that are being kind of thrown around, this really isn't an informal conversational piece, right? So we can automatically eliminate that. Next, we have B, formal and scientific. Absolutely, this is being conducted in a scientific manner. It's very formal. They're presenting their findings. So this could be the correct answer, but let's take a look at our other options. We have personal and subjective. Not very personal, right? We're not looking at uh, particular words like we're having a conversation and being personal. So we can automatically eliminate that. And then lastly, we have emotional and persuasive. There's not a whole lot of persuasive writing in here. There's not a lot of emotional writing in here. It's literally just the deliverance of facts of what's going on with this particular study when it comes to heart health. So based out of all of our options, the correct answer is going to be B, formal and scientific. So let's talk about biases versus stereotypes. They're two completely different things. So how do we figure out which is what, right? So bias is a personal opinion in favor of or against a person, group, or thing. It can be either positive, it can be negative, and it often impacts decision-making and attitudes unconsciously, right? So an example of this could be a hiring manager believes candidates from Ivy League schools are always more qualified than those from other universities. This is one person's opinion or bias on a particular group of people. In this case, it's the candidates for this position. Now, with stereotypes, we're looking at a more fixed, generalized beliefs some people have towards a particular group or class of people. So it really is an oversimplified and often inaccurate perception that doesn't consider individual differences. So with biases, we're looking at individuals. With stereotypes, we're looking at groups. 
So an example of this could be people assume that all teenagers are irresponsible and addicted to social media. This is a stereotype as it's a generalized belief by a group of people that believes teens are irresponsible. So let's take a look at some additional examples just to help clear up the differences between that bias and that stereotype. So a bias could be, I prefer hiring younger people because they're more innovative. Whereas a stereotype would be, young people are always on their phone and can't focus for long periods. You see how that kind of changed? We're still talking about younger people, younger employees, but it's either coming from a bias standpoint when it comes to personal opinion, or it's coming from like a generalized group opinion when it comes to a stereotypes. Let's take a look at another example. So when it comes to a bias, someone could say, in my opinion, older teachers are better because they have more experience. In contrast, in contrast to that, with the stereotype, we have older workers are not good with technology. You see how that changes from one's personal opinion to a generalization of a group? Let's take a look at our last example. I always choose younger doctors. I believe they're more up to date with medical advancements. That's a bias. Whereas with the stereotype, it could be young people are reckless and don't consider the consequences of their actions. Let's take a look at our first practice question. So what does the author's statement in the article suggest? So we're trying to figure out if we're looking at a bias, or we're looking at a stereotype. So the question or the passage states, based on my extensive experience in the corporate sector, it's become evident that younger people often lack the same level of commitment and professionalism as their older counterparts. From what I've observed, many of the younger generation seems to prioritize personal interests over the company goals, a stark contrast to the dedication I noticed in employees from previous generations. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at a lot of I words, right? And based on my extensive experience, from what I've observed. So we're most likely looking at somebody's bias, right? So we have A. It is a factual representation of generational differences in the workplace. We can't really tell if this is fact, right? There's no statistics, no data, nothing that suggests this. So we can automatically eliminate that. Then we have B. It reflects a personal opinion based on the author's experiences. Well, this could absolutely be correct, right? Because they use words like my extensive experience, what I've observed. So let's put that on the back burner and look at our other answers. C, it's an unbiased observation about changing workplace cultures. Well, it really is kind of biased, right? We know we have a bias because they're speaking of their personal opinion, their personal observations. So we can automatically eliminate that. And then lastly, we have D, it is a statistical backed analysis of employees' behavior across generations. Again, there's no statistics here. So based out of all the answers that we have, the most correct answer is going to be B. It reflects personal opinion based on the author's experiences. Just like with bias and stereotypes, we also have to distinguish between fact and opinion. So a fact is information that can be verified, it can be proven. So for example, and a fact can be the human heart typically beats between 60 to 100 beats per minute at rest, right? This is a statement of fact because it presents objective data about the human heart that can be verified and measured. It's based on that scientific observation that can be proven through empirical evidence. So when we're looking at fact, we're looking at things that make sense. They can be verified, they can be measurable. An extra tip when it comes to your T's is that if the passage contains any kind of numbers, it's almost always going to be a fact, okay? Facts are characterized by their lack of emotional content as well. You're not going to see a lot of emotional words. They do not express the author's personal beliefs or biases in the information that's being presented. If you're seeing things like that, you're most likely looking at an opinion. So an opinion is subjective. It's based on personal views emotions and interpretations. So there's a short list of words that are really going to be imperative when it comes to taking your teeth. Just like we saw with stereotypes and biases, you're going to see opinion words like should, best, most, good, better, worst, scenes, and more. You're going to see those kind of words in sentences. So an opinion could be jogging in the morning is the best form of exercise to maintain a healthy heart, right? That's that opinion word, best. This statement is an opinion because it expresses a personal belief and preference about jogging and the benefits of heart health. 
Opinions are going to be subjective. They can vary from person to person. What constitutes the best form of exercise for one person can vary differently from another group of people or an individual. So making that statement really is going to be opinion based. So let's take a look at some additional examples to hopefully help drive this home when you're taking your teas. First example is it's 70 degrees outside. Yes, absolutely. That's fact. I can look on my phone. I can look at a news report. They're going to tell me it's 70 degrees outside. It is verifiable, right? Versus an opinion of that could be it's too hot outside, right? 70 degrees might not be hot to some people. Some individuals it could be, some it couldn't be. So that is absolutely somebody's personal opinion. Next, we have the Amazon rainforest is the largest rainforest in the world covering over 5.5 million square kilometers. Again, we have a number, so that's fact. It's also verifiable, right? We can look in a textbook, we can look up news articles about the Amazon rainforest. We're able to verify that information. Whereas with an opinion, it could be the Amazon rainforest is the most, remember those words, most impressive rainforest in the world. That is again, someone's personal belief. It's their personal opinion. And then with our last example, we have as of 2023, the most powerful supercomputer can perform over a quintillion calculations per second. So again, that is verifiable. We have numbers and we are able to measure and verify those things. This is a fact. Whereas with an opinion, we have supercomputers are more important for scientific advancement than traditional research methods. So we got those uh, trigger words when we're looking at an opinion, right? That more, best, most, all of those type of words. So again, that last example is going to be an opinion. So let's take a look at some practice questions to help kind of bring all of this home. So our practice question states, which of the following best describes the statement? So the passage reads, according to a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, individuals who follow a Mediterranean rich diet and fruits, vegetables, and whole grains have a 25% lower risk of heart disease compared to those who follow a standard Western diet. So let's take a look at our options. An opinion about the Mediterranean diet. While it could potentially be seen as an opinion, we have statistical data in here, right? They say 25% lower risk of heart disease compared to those who follow a standard Western diet. So it's not somebody's personal belief, somebody's personal opinion. We have a lot of informational, factual, as well as statistical data. So we can automatically eliminate that. Next we have B, a fact based on a published medical study. Yes, right? That's exactly what I was talking about. It gives us a number. We know that there's a fact piece taking place. And it also talks about it being published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So this absolutely could be answer B. But let's take a look at our last two answers. A hypothesis about dietary impacts on heart disease. Again, there's not really a hypothesis here. They've already done the experiment, which is why they have statistical data. So we can get rid of that. And the last one is an anecdotal observation about dietary preferences. Again, we can get rid of that. So based out of all of the options that we have available to us, B is going to be the most correct answer. Let's take a look at one more example. What type of statement is primarily presented in this passage? So the passage reads, many healthcare professionals believe that a plant-based diet is the most effective way to prevent chronic diseases. They argue that this diet rich in fruits, vegetables, and grains offers the best balance of nutrients for long-term health. So as we're reading this, I'm noticing some words, right? We see words like most effective, right? That most, that's usually an opinion word, but let's take a look at our answers and see what we have. So A, a fact supported by universal scientific consensus. Well, there's not really a whole lot of statistical data. There's not really a whole lot of informative information in here, so we can automatically eliminate that. A general observation based on common dietary patterns. We don't really have a whole lot of information about dietary patterns. It's specifically providing us information about one specific thing, that plant-based diet. So we can automatically eliminate that. C, an opinion held by some healthcare professionals. Well, absolutely, because as the passage starts, it states many healthcare professionals. And we know that it's an opinion because it uses words like most, right? So we can keep that one as a potential answer. And then our last option is a proven guideline for chronic disease prevention. Again, 
It's not proven. There's no statistical data. There's no research study, nothing in here that suggests that this is a proven guideline. So based on all the answers that we have available to us, the most correct answer is going to be C, an opinion held by some healthcare professionals. So let's move on to context clues. So context clues are hints a reader can use to discover the meaning of unfamiliar words and phrases. How are you going to do that? We're going to look for words in the context themselves and the sentences around them. So let's look at some practice examples. So example one states, during the intense summer heat, the arid landscape seemed almost lifeless with only a few cacti dotting the horizon. So our word that's in red, arid, that's the one that we are trying to figure out what it means. So the phrases that they use around it are like intense summer heat. That's the description word about the landscape. It's almost lifeless. There's only a few cacti. So it's really suggesting that it's a dry, barren environment. So these clues help us to conclude that arid most likely means dry, lacking in moisture, typically used to describe a desert or some kind of similar environment. Our next example states the children's ebullient laughter filled the room as they excitingly shared stories of their day at school. So again, that word in red is what we are trying to define. So in order to define us, we had to use those context clues that are found around that word. So we have words like child's laughter filling the room and their behavior as being excitingly sharing stories. So it might suggest that this word means some kind of lively, enthusiastic atmosphere. So in conclusion, we can kind of say that this word may mean that it's being full of energy, cheerful, as well as enthusiastic. When you're looking at context clues, you're looking at four different types of encounters that can take place. So starting with definition, this is when the author gives the meaning of the word right in the sentence. It's like having a mini dictionary with inside the text, right? So an example could be an arbitrarium, a garden devoted to trees, was Jane's favorite place to visit. Here, the garden devoted to trees is directly giving you the definition of the word, right? So that is what we're seeing when we're looking at definition. Next, we're going to look at restatement. So restatement typically involves rephrasing the unknown word in a way that makes it seem more clear. So an example of this could be, he was elated, so happy that he couldn't stop smiling. So happy is a restatement that clarifies what elated means means. So that's what we're looking at when we have restatement. Our third choice can be contrast, right? So here the author is going to give you the opposite to help you understand the word. So a example of this could be unlike his Gregatia sister who loves socializing, Joe was shy and reserved, right? So the contrast to Gregatius helps us understand that Joe is the opposite, indicating that he's more shy and reserved than his sister. And then for our last example, we have inference. So inference, you're going to have to do a little bit of detective work when it comes to trying to figure out what a word means. So for an example here, she trudged through the snow, her feet heavy and cold. We can infer trudged implies that she had to do this kind of slow, laborious walk without being without it actually being directly stated within the example. So these are the top four kind of context clues that you're going to find when you're trying to define words on the cheese. So our first question states, based on the passage, what can be inferred about Mark's personality? So we're trying to do a little detective work here, right? Because we have the word inferred. So the passage states, unlike his brother, who is loquacious and often the center of attention at social gatherings, Mark is reticent. He seldom initiates conversations and prefers to listen rather than speak in group settings. So let's take a look at our first option. We have A, he is outgoing and enjoys socializing. Well, we know that's not true because he tends to not want to initiate any conversations, right? He seldom does that. So he's not very good at the socializing aspect. So we can automatically eliminate A. B, he's reserved and less talkative than his brother. Absolutely, he's reserved. He doesn't really want to initiate a whole lot of con conversations. And he prefers to listen rather than speak. So that's where that less talkative, he's reserved comes in. So this could be the correct answer, but let's look at our other options. He dislikes attending social gatherings. 
Well, we don't really know if that's true. He's there, but it doesn't really state that he doesn't like to be there, right? So it can automatically eliminate that one. And D, he is more popular than his two brothers. Well, we know that is incorrect, right? Because he is more reserved. He's more shy. He doesn't really want to have a whole lot of conversations. So based on all of the options that we have available to us, the correct answer is going to be B. He is reserved and less talkative than his brother. Let's just talk about figurative language. So figurative language refers to a set of literacy techniques that enhance your writing by adding new meaning or context beyond just the basic literal facts. So there's four types of different figurative language that you're going to encounter on the T's and they are simile, personification, metaphor, and hyperbole. So let's break each one of these down. So when we're looking at simile types of figurative language, we're looking for words like like, and as. There's going to be a direct comparison between two ideas. So words like life is like a box of chocolates. I came in like a wrecking ball. Those are things that you're going to see when it comes to simile. When it comes to metaphor, you're going to be looking for words like is and was. So that's a comparison that makes an implied or hidden connection between two ideas. So love is an open door. Life is a highway, right? That's more of a metaphor. So simile, we have like and as. Metaphor, we have is and was. Next, we have personification. So it's like giving a non-human object human characteristics. So the C was angry that day. Well, the C is not really angry, right? It's just probably was really choppy, but we're giving it human characteristics to make it more personal. And then lastly, we have hyperbole. So that's an exaggerated claim that emphasizes a point, right? So maybe you've had grandparents. I know I had grandparents that used to say, I would walk 500 miles to get through to school in the snow with no shoes and no coat, right? That is a hyperbole. They're exaggerating that claim to emphasize their point. They probably did have to walk quite a bit of miles or quite a bit of way to get to school, but it doesn't mean that they walked 500 miles. They're really exaggerating that. And for our last section, we're going to look at types of writing. So we have informative, persuasive, entertaining, descriptive, and expository. So let's take a look at each one. So we're going to start with informative writing. So the main purpose is to provide information and facts, right? It's going to focus on delivering data, statistics, and straightforward facts to educate the reader on a specific topic. So you're going to see a lot of neutral and unbiased language. It's going to avoid any kind of like persuasive language, personal opinions. We're strictly sticking to facts, numbers. You're going to see a lot of this when it comes to like news reports, research papers, factual brochures, as well as encyclopedia entries. So that's where you're going to see this the most. An example of this could be the Amazon rainforest spans over 2.1 million square miles housing diverse wildlife and ecosystems, right? We have numbers. It's a fact. We can identify it. We can measure it. We can look it up. Next, we have persuasive writing. So really with persuasive writing, the main objective is to convince or persuade the reader to agree with the author's point of view or to take a specific action. It's about influencing the reader's thoughts as well as their actions. So you're going to see a lot of things like emotional appeals, strong opinions, and argumentative techniques. It can include rhetorical questions, evidence, persuasive language to make a compelling case. So examples where you might see this could be like opinion editorials, advertisements, speeches, cover, cover letters, and even sales pitches. An example of this could be implementing renewable energy sources can significantly reduce global carbon emissions and save our planet, right? This is giving the person an action. It's, it's appealing to their emotional uh, appeal because again, we're talking about reducing those global carbon emissions by implementing this one piece of thing. Next, we have entertaining writing. So entertaining, the goal of this is really to provide the reader with enjoyment, amusement, as well as pleasure. It's meant to engage and captivates the audience's attention about what the author is trying to convey. So you're going to see a lot of like narrative techniques, humor, imaginative storytelling, and creative language. It's really characterized by the ability to evoke emotion, whether it's about laughter, suspense, excitement, or other feelings, right? 
So you're going to see this in a lot of like novels, short stories, comedic articles, plays, and even some kind of poetry. So an example of this could be the wizard vanished into a cloud of smoke, leaving behind only a trace of sparkling embers, right? It's very imaginative. It's very storytelling. It's exciting. It's trying to get you in that mood just to give you that pleasure. Our fourth one is descriptive writing. So the goal when it comes to descriptive writing is really to paint a picture in the reader's mind. It's about describing and detailing a scene, person, place, or an object to make the reader visualize and experience what it is that they are trying to convey. So characteristics of this could be like using sensory details, figurative language, like similes and metaphors that we talked about before. They can also use evocative descriptions. It's really going to focus on your five senses, right? You really should have something about your sight, sound, smell, touch, and taste to create a strong impression. When we're looking at examples of this, you're going to see this in like literature fiction, travel writing, nature writing, character sketches, as well as even like personal essays. So an example of this could be the sunset painted the sky in hues of orange, pink, and purple, casting a warm glow over the tranquil sea. See how they kind of painted that picture? They want you to feel what it is that they're doing, where they are at, what it looks like. And then lastly, we have expository writing. So with this kind of writing, it's going to aim to explain, clarify, and provide information about a topic. What it's also going to inform, it's going to go further into offer a deeper understanding or insight into a subject matter. So you're going to see elements like, you know, argumentation, comparison, analysis, cause and effect, relationships. It's going to break down complex ideas and to more understandable parts. So you're gonna see this a lot when it comes to academic essays, how-to guides, textbooks, business reports, as well as technical writing. So an example of this could be photosynthesis in plants involves converting sunlight into energy using water and carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen as a byproduct. It's informative and it also explains the process, right? So when we're using terms like informative and expository writing, they're often used interchangeably, but they do have some subtle differences between them. Informative is going to be more about stating the facts. Expository is going to be more about going into the details and the steps about those facts. So let's take a look at some practice questions to tie this all together. So our question states, which writing style does the above passage represent? So we're looking at persuasive, descriptive, informative, or narrative. So let's take a look. The Great Barrier Reef located off the coast of Queensland, Australia, is the world's largest coral reef system comprised of over 2,900 individual reefs and 900 islands. It stretches for over 1,400 miles and can be seen from space. The reef is a hotspot for biodiversity, supporting a wide range of marine life, including numerous species of fish, mollusks, birds, and sea turtles. So when we're taking a look at this, we have a lot of numbers, right? We have a lot of statistical data. So remember, when we're looking at informative writing, we're looking at that statistical data. We're not, it doesn't really go much more into detail about like how the sea life live and how they work together and why it's a bio hotspot for biodiversity. So we can automatically eliminate it as being expository writing. Because it has a lot of those numbers, the 2,900 individual reefs, 900 islands, 1,400 miles can be seen from space, all of that information. Really, we're looking at more informative writing. So our correct answer is going to be C and formative. I hope that this information was easy to understand when it comes to the ATIT's reading portion of the exam. As always, if you have any questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to nursechunkstore.com where there's a ton of additional resources to help you ace that exam. And as always, I'll catch you in the next video. Bye!